Chapter 3 Jackson tried to refuse Andrea's book tour. He cited all sorts of excuses, from stage fright to family obligations to being unable to get away from farm work. Andrea shot down each of them and insisted it was important for J.D. Emerson to invest in her career by doing this. She threatened to come out and visit J.D. personally to make sure this happened. Wouldn't Andrea be surprised if she met the real J.D.? Problem was, he had the feeling she would like Jackson Davis even more and would probably want to promote him. The oddity of a male writing romance novels in a female-dominated field would be worth a lot of press. Press he didn't want. He liked remaining anonymous. It would be a disaster if word got out about his second stream of income. Jackson wrote an email, flatly refusing to do the tour and television spot. He was about to finish it when he heard his mom talking to her book club guests. He remembered that Katie was supposed to come as well. Jackson sauntered to the kitchen, pretending to need something to drink just to see what was going on. His mother was spreading out baked goods and tea to the six ladies in the living room area. He saw the local school librarian, Millie, his mother's friends, Annette and Tracy, Jane, who owned the quilt shop and tea room, plus Pearl, who was one of the town's oldest residents and still sharp as a tack. There was no sign of Katie yet. He wondered if her car had started. It seemed an unreliable vehicle. Jackson frowned as he sipped a coffee, leaning in the door jam and listening as the group began discussing a book. A particular phrase caught his attention, and Jackson tore his thoughts away from Katie to listen more closely. It took him a moment, but he recognized the characters. Sure enough, they were discussing his latest release. His mother caught his look of disbelief and defended their choice. I know it's not one of our normal books, but every once in a while a woman needs a little fluff and romance in her life. Plus, J.D. is going to become really popular. There was an article in the entertainment section that she's scheduled to have a book tour and appear on Ruby's daytime talk show. I wonder what J.D. is really like, Millie ventured thoughtfully. It's obvious she comes from a rural community. The details about country life are really accurate. <laughs> the details might be accurate, Annette chimed in. However, she might work on her romance scenes. I found them to be a little limited. They are awkward sometimes. Tracy concurred as she took off her sweater and got ready to settle onto the sofa. I kind of cringed during the first kiss of this book. It just wasn't quite right. Jackson blinked. No one had told him that before. He knew he always felt a little weird writing those parts of the book, and apparently some people picked up on that. He wondered what he could do to make it better. Excuse me, Katie said from behind him and Jackson straightened guiltily. He hadn't meant to be caught eavesdropping on the group. He hadn't heard Katie come in, but then she always had the run of the house and didn't need to knock. Sorry, Jackson mumbled as he got out of the way. He felt a little strange around Katie after today. He wondered what the results of the pregnancy test were, but it wasn't like he could just ask her. They just weren't that close. Katie handed him the bag of groceries that had gotten mixed up. In all the fuss that was going on lately, Jackson had forgotten about the groceries that Katie had mistakenly gotten. Thank you again for getting my keys. Not a problem. Jackson was glad he could do that little thing for her. Someone really ought to be caring for Katie. She needed someone to look after her. She gave him a small smile and went to sit with the rest of the ladies. Jackson decided to put away the groceries. He would have liked to hear what else the group had to say about his book, but it would look odd if he did sit in. Then again, he could ask his mom later. Jackson absently tossed the plastic bag in the garbage and took the shoe polish to the mudroom where it belonged. Maybe what he needed wasn't to cancel the tour. Maybe what he needed was someone else to be the face of J.D. Emerson. Why not ask his mom how the feedback was at the book club? Why not let her in on what he was doing to make sure they stayed solvent? Why not make her the face of J.D. Emerson? There was no one he trusted more. She would be a good fit for the pen name. 
She was a farm wife from the country. He thought it was the perfect solution. His mom was always talking about traveling a little more now that Stacy was at school. This would get her a free trip for just a little bit of her time. Jackson felt pretty pleased with himself for thinking up such an easy solution and was glad he hadn't sent that email. He would talk to his mom tonight after the meeting was over, he decided. The more he thought of the idea, the more he liked it. Whistling, he got dressed for the cold and went to check on the livestock. It wouldn't take long to take a quick look in the barn. Two hours later, he came out of the barn with a scraped and slightly swollen hand, plus a dislike for a new heifer that had decided to try to jump a fence and had gotten caught on the gate. It had been a struggle, but he managed to get the heifer freed without any obvious injury to it, and only a minor injury to himself. He trudged to the house as the first snowflakes of the season began to dance from the sky. It was a little early for snow, and any flakes would soon melt. The weatherman was calling for rain tomorrow, then sun for the rest of the week. Most of the cars were gone, except for Katie's, which was making a grinding noise as she tried to get the engine to turn over. Walking over, Jackson knocked on the driver's side window and watched her jump in surprise before opening the window. The car was so old it still had window handles to manually roll them down. Not starting? Jackson asked the obvious. I don't know why, sighed Katie. I just got it serviced two weeks ago. Pop the hood. Jackson waited until she did, and used his limited knowledge to rule out a few simple ideas. He dropped the hood back down. Spark plugs are clean. No corrosion on your battery connections. Everything looks good that I can think of. Do you think you may have flooded it? I'm not that bad with cars. Katie rolled her eyes. She tried it one more time without success. She could see the dollars leaving her meager savings account. I'll have to have it towed to the garage when they open tomorrow. Why don't I give you a ride home? He offered. Thanks. Katie grabbed her purse and followed him into the house. Jackson, you are not going to believe it! Donna grinned as she came to the mudroom. Oh, Katie, are you still here? My car won't start. Katie gave a lopsided smile. She had learned long ago that smiling through her luck was the only way to keep from yelling or crying about it. I was just going to give her a ride back to town. Jackson watched his mom curiously. It was obvious that she was excited. What's going on? Annette and Tracy are going on a cruise with a group, and one of the ladies have cancelled at the last minute. Donna practically bounced from foot to foot. She was so thrilled. They offered me the ticket for nothing. It's a month long, and it leaves next Thursday. Wow, Jackson breathed. That was really nice of them. It was also very inconvenient for him. It was, Donna agreed happily. I can't wait to go. I'm going to find out what I all need to pack. Have fun on your trip, Mrs. Davis, Katie said a little wistfully. She had never been on any vacations. A cruise sounded heavenly. How many times do I have to ask you to call me Donna? She admonished Katie before she broke out into a grin. It's going to be great. Jackson watched her happily return to cleaning up after the book club. You don't seem that thrilled for her, Katie remarked, watching him. Jackson shrugged and grabbed the keys to the truck off the key hook. I was going to ask her to do something for me. It puts a crimp in my plans, but she's happy, so I'll readjust somehow. She will have a good time with Annette and Tracy. She's always wanted to do something like this. It's supposed to be to the Bahamas. It would be nice to go someplace warm at this time of year. Katie followed him out to the truck. She was surprised when Jackson got the door for her. It wasn't as common for a man to do such a gentlemanly thing any more. Thank you. I'm not much for traveling, but I know Mom will enjoy it. Jackson started the truck. The ride back to town was quiet. It was obvious Jackson was thinking about something, and Katie decided to leave him to his thoughts. Hers were focused on how exactly she was going to manage this month's bills. Before long, they were at her apartment complex, and Katie was no closer to any solutions. Jackson got out of the truck, and Katie scrambled to get out before he got to her door. Jackson, you don't need to walk me to the door or anything. I'll be fine. I'll get the car tomorrow, and you don't have to worry about it. 
I wasn't worried about that. Jackson looked down at her with a frown. I'm a bit worried about you. I'm fine, Katie said to reassure him. I know things don't look great at the moment, but I'm sure it will all work out. Jackson doubted things had been working for her in a while. He wished he could help her. Then again, maybe there was a way he could. Do you mind if I come in to talk to you for a moment? Katie really didn't want him in her home. It was tiny and not all that clean since she was busy lately. Everything was dated, and there were a few maintenance issues that were never going to be dealt with since the landlord just didn't care. However, she couldn't really think of a reason for him not to come inside. Okay. She led the way, unlocking the door and going to the kitchen, which was tidier than the living room. Jackson seemed to fill the entire space, making her nervous. Would you like something to drink? No, thanks. Jackson thought the place was depressing. It was old and not in a good antique way. The countertop was curling up at the edges. The stove was scratched up. There was a crack in one of the window panes over the sink. He sighed. I have a bit of a problem, and I think you might be able to help me out. Katie frowned. She didn't see Jackson as ever having any real problems. She leaned against the counter. What is it? Jackson took a deep breath and looked Katie in the eyes. He hoped he could trust her. I need you to pose as J.D. Emerson. Katie blinked. He wasn't making any sense. Pardon? You what? I need you to pose as J.D. Emerson. She's going on a book tour, and I need you to pretend to be her. Jackson repeated his request and waited a little nervously to see how she would react. I don't understand, Katie responded with a confused smile. Why would I pose as J.D. Emerson? Why doesn't J.D. Emerson be J.D. Emerson? She's a pen name. She doesn't exist. He frowned. This was harder to explain than he liked. I write the books, and now I was committed by my agent to go on this tour, which obviously I can't go on, because everyone thinks that J.D. is a woman. You write the books? Katie eyed him, wondering if he was joking. Jackson didn't seem the type to write romance books. He was the sort of man who judged sheep at the local 4-H groups. He split wood with the logging group. He hit home runs at baseball and drank beer with the guys. Katie didn't think she'd ever seen him pick up a book unless it was related to farming. You are saying that you are J.D. Emerson? Yes. I can prove it if you like. I'm working on the next manuscript and it's not finished. Jackson shrugged uncomfortably. You can read it. You want me to pretend to be J.D.? Her brow furrowed as she tried to understand his odd request. Why? It's obvious you need another stream of income. I can give you part of the royalties if you become the face of J.D. Jackson put a hand up to forestall any objections. I needed the income too, which is why I started all this. The books have been the reason I've kept the farm afloat and have been able to pay for Trent and Stacy's schooling. Can you afford to pay me to do this? Katie wasn't sure that she believed him. A rough and ready farmer, upstanding man in the community, moonlighting as a romance author. It didn't seem feasible. Andrea, that's the agent. She says sales will probably triple or more if the book tour happens, especially with the appearance on the daytime talk show Ruby, he explained. If I give you 20% of my royalties, it will help both of us. 20%? echoed Katie. She wondered what that was in real cash. Okay, twenty-five, Jackson decided on the spur of the moment. That's as far as I can go. I have bills, too. You're serious about this? She tilted her head, studying him. J.D. Emerson. J for Jackson, D for Davis, and Emerson is my middle name, Jackson responded. It seemed fitting. I think I need to sit down. Katie grabbed a chair, plopping down into it. She looked at him in disbelief. It's like you had a secret identity all along. Do I really know you? Jackson smiled and pulled out a chair for himself to sit in. I'm still me. I just write some books. However, no one else can know about it. I don't want anyone to find out. Really? Why? Katie shook her head in wonder. Why wouldn't you want everyone to know? For starters, everyone has assumed J.D. is a woman for the past seven years, Jackson said wryly. 
then there's my reputation in the community. While the ladies might get a kick out of it, the guys will rip me till I'm right sore from their teasing. I don't intend to be the butt of anyone's jokes. Then why did you start writing? Katie asked curiously. At first it was a joke, and then it was to prove that I could. Next, the money started coming in, and it was handy, sighed Jackson. It had been timely, too, seeing those royalty checks. They had needed the money, and it had become necessary to have that second income. Now I kind of enjoy it. Wow, Katie remarked. This is just so weird. Wait, did you say Ruby? The daytime talk show? The very one, he confirmed. I can't do it. Katie swallowed hard, a ball of fear nodding in her abdomen. If you want me to sit and sign books, fine, I can do that. I can even read a chapter. What I can't do is go before an audience and speak rationally. You saw the ninth grade play. You know I'm terrible. I freeze in front of an audience. There's no way I can do it on television. Katie, I need you to go on the show. It's pivotal to gaining readership nationwide. The more readers we have, the more sales we make. Andrea was adamant about it. Jackson reached out and took her hand. He didn't like to see the fear in her eyes. I can come with you. I'll stand backstage the whole time. All you need to do is answer some questions from Ruby. You don't even have to look at the audience. Just look at her. The tour is for a few weeks, then we'll be home again. A shiver of excitement shot up her arm from where his warm hand held hers. Either that, or it was from being petrified of being on television. Katie wasn't quite certain. Jackson, I don't know about this. You can do it, he replied. Plus, it looks like you could really use the income. Katie winced. He was right. She desperately needed money. She knew it was just a matter of time before her job was made redundant. Taking a deep breath and bolstering her courage, Katie made the decision. Okay. Really? Jackson smiled in relief, and it did funny things to Katie's stomach. Thank you. Katie gave a half-hearted smile through the fear in her stomach. She wasn't sure she could do what he was asking her to. Then again, she would get to spend more time with Jackson Davis, the oblivious object of her affections. She wasn't sure which was more nerve-wracking. Jackson glanced at his watch and let go of her hand. I'd better get back before Mom wonders what happened to me. Katie felt a pang of loss over the absence of Jackson's hand on hers and wondered how he couldn't seem to feel the chemistry between them that she did. As usual, he was completely blind to the effect that he had on her. Then again, maybe that was a good thing. She would hate to have him know just how bad she was crushing on him. Jackson would just look at her in pity, and Katie wasn't sure if she could suffer through that. She walked Jackson to the door. Don't forget to lock up right after I go, Jackson said in concern for her safety. This isn't exactly the best area of town. Katie resisted the urge to roll her eyes at him. He was acting like she was some child to be left home alone for the first time. I lock up every night. I've never had a problem here. I'll let you know about the details of the tour. Have a good night, Katie. Jackson pulled the door shut behind him. Good night. She locked the door and then peered out the peephole, watching Jackson get into his truck and drive away. Moments later, her phone was chirping in her pocket. Hello? The illustrious Jackson Davis in your apartment? Tell me all, Sylvia demanded happily. Katie sighed. There was no way that she could tell Sylvia everything. So she began shutting off lights and getting ready for bed as she filled her friend in on what little she could. I needed a ride home because the car quit at Mrs. Davis's house. Jackson was kind enough to give me one. I asked him if he wanted some coffee or something, and we talked. He treated me like I was his ten-year-old sister and left to go home. By the way, he gives the impression that my neighbors are criminals. Mm, Huey is on parole and Brian is an ex-con, Sylvie admitted a little wryly. However, that's not a reason to disparage the neighborhood. Exactly, Katie agreed, feeling a little indignant. Not that the poor house apartments were her first choice of residence, but they weren't all that bad. At least, that was what Katie told herself. Jackson literally stood out my door until he heard the locks go. He's protective of you, teased Sylvie. He's playing big brother like always, said Katie unhappily. Nothing new. 
That's a shame. Sylvie crunched on something over the phone. The least he could do is give you a good night kiss after walking you to the door. Sylvie, Katie sighed. It wasn't a date. Yeah, yeah, Sylvie said dismissively. What are you going to do to get this guy's attention in the right way? Nothing, Katie said firmly. Short of outright telling him I have the hots for him, I don't think he would understand anyways. There was silence over the phone. Don't even think about it, Katie warned her friend. She decided to change the subject. Did you take the test? Sylvie groaned. Remember what you said about condoms being cheaper than diapers? Yes, Katie waited patiently. Life is about to get a whole lot more expensive. Sylvie heaved a deep breath. Congratulations, Katie squealed. This is so exciting. It was exciting the first two times. Now, not so much, Sylvie complained. Not that I won't love this kid. I will. However, it's not a good time. Neil just lost his job. He goes for the interview tomorrow. We are existing up from my wages at the diner, and we all know that's not going to last. People are already tightening their pocketbooks and not spending extra cash now that Hawkins closed. My tips are abysmal. The good news is you kept all the baby stuff from your youngest, right? Katie tried to find the silver lining in all this. That way you won't have to spend all that much when the baby comes. I will have to haul it out of storage. Sylvie crunched on something again, the noise echoing over the phone. Just diapers. Lots of diapers. You could go cloth like our grandmothers did, Katie pointed out, teasing her friend. Not on your life, laughed Sylvie. See, it could always be worse, Katie noted with a laugh. I'm going to let you go. I have work tomorrow morning early, and I need to get a tow truck out to the Davis farm for my car. I will take that as my cue to get off the phone, responded Sylvie. However, we are not done talking about Jackson. As Sylvie hung up, Katie wondered how she was going to explain being gone for weeks at the same time Jackson was. Someone in the community was bound to notice, and there would be questions when they came back. She didn't even want to think about what would happen if the gossips in town caught wind of her feelings for Jackson. Groaning, Katie set her alarm and got into bed. Kate Temple picked Katie up at the crack of dawn and brought her to the Davis farm. The tow truck operator chatted about the closing of the furniture factory. He surmised that he was going to have to shut down his own business within a couple of years and would likely have to relocate to a larger town to start over. Katie replied as necessary, nursing her coffee from a beat-up travel mug. It was too hot. She grimaced and set it on the hood of the tow truck as Cade looked over her car. Thankfully, Jackson was out doing chores in the barn, so he wasn't here to set her nerves on edge. Cade whistled as he surveyed the hatchback. This thing still runs? Yes, Katie sighed and looked at her watch. She didn't want to be late for work. Cade leaned down and pulled on her bumper. With a creak and a groan, it fell off. I'm not sure the frame is solid enough to tow it onto the flatbed. I might end up doing more damage. This thing doesn't look safe to drive, Katie. It's all I have to get me to and from work, plus the occasional trip to visit my parents, Katie said flatly as she eyed the bumper. It was too early in the morning to get upset about it. Cade would tack it back on somehow. Do you have your keys? he asked. Katie fished them out of her pocket, handing them to Cade. He tried to start it with no result, listening with a practiced ear. Popping the hood, Cade folded himself over to be able to peer into the space. Katie leaned against the tow truck. Cade was a mechanic as well. He had to pull double duty with the two jobs to make a living. She hoped he would get her car to run again. Here's your problem. Cade held up a filter. It's your fuel filter. It's so full of gunk the gas could hardly get past it. When's the last time you had this thing serviced? Three weeks ago, frowned Katie. They did all the filters. I saw them working on the car. If that's the case, you have a real problem, Katie. Cade went to the truck, pulling out a box with all sorts of spare parts. Something inside the gas lines or fuel tank is breaking inside and causing the buildup. It's not going to be a cheap fix. Just her luck. Katie watched as he put in a new filter. Great. 
This filter isn't quite the right size, but it'll do until I can get it changed. Come by the shop this week and I'll switch it out. Cade grabbed the bumper, putting it in his truck. I'll put the bumper back on too. Try to start it. Thanks, Cade. Katie jumped in the driver's seat. This time, the hatchback roared to life before settling down to a purr. Cade coughed on the exhaust fumes, grabbing Katie's travel mug. Here, don't forget your morning caffeine. Thank you again. What do I owe you? Katie placed the mug in the cup holder. I pulled off your bumper. I'd say you can let me fix that for free, and I'll even throw in the fuel filters. Besides, I'll get you later for fixing either the lines or the tank, grinned Cade. If I were you, I wouldn't drive too far in this death trap. You never know when it's going to quit. She thanked Cade again, vowing to pick him up a loaf of banana bread from the milk box at some point for his troubles. At the daycare, Katie pulled into an empty spot and made a dash for the building. She had barely a minute to spare before she dumped her purse in the staff room. Katie, smiled Jenny, just on time. Where are the donuts? Oh, Katie stopped suddenly as she remembered. It's Tuesday and it's my turn to buy the donuts. I am so sorry. I'll bring them in tomorrow, I promise. Each week, members of the staff would bring in donuts or other baked goods from the milk box, a local bakery and ice cream shop on a Tuesday. It helped keep the daycare attendants sane while supporting the local economy. That's okay. Ginny pulled in a disappointed breath. I'm sure we can enjoy them tomorrow. Sorry, Katie muttered as she quickly went about her assigned duties. Wiping drool from a toddler, she noticed that there were a lot fewer kids at the daycare today. Where is everyone? Since a lot of people from the factory are out of work, most of those parents are keeping their children at home, responded Ginny. We had a rash of people call in and cancel their child care this morning. Really? asked Katie. A ball of dread formed in the pit of her stomach. Looking around, she could estimate that two-thirds of the kids simply weren't in daycare today. It made for an overabundance of staff. Carla's holding a meeting later this morning, Ginny confided to Katie with a staged whisper. Thank goodness I have seniority. Yeah, you're lucky that way, echoed Katie. This was probably it, then. She would lose her job today. Just when she needed to repair her car so that she could live out of it while she tried to find another job. Then again, Jackson had said he would give her 25% of royalties to be the face of J.D. Emerson. Jackson wasn't the type to joke about something like that. Katie wondered just how much money it would be per month and if she could live off it. She wondered when she would get her first pay from Jackson. Carla called the meeting. She handed out envelopes to anyone who would be let go effective immediately. Inside the envelopes were references, last paychecks, and severance packages. She thanked them all for their time and service as her employees. Carla wished them all the best. Katie got an envelope. Not bothering to look inside, Katie grabbed her jacket and purse. She checked to see if she had left anything else in the staff room. I'm so sorry, Katie. I'm sure you'll get another job quickly, commiserated Ginny. Thank goodness I was one of the first employees hired here. Otherwise, I would be let go as well. Katie forced herself to smile at Ginny. I'll be fine, Ginny. People have kids and always need child care providers. I might have to move, but I'm sure I'll get another placement. That you will, dear. Ginny gave her a hug and a pat on the arm. Are you still going to pick up the donuts for today? Katie blinked in surprise. No, I have to watch my pennies now that I'm unemployed. Ginny nodded and moved on to talk to the next employee who had been dismissed. Ignoring Ginny, Katie gave each of the kids a hug before heading out of the daycare for the last time. Thank you for listening to Kissing Katie. If you enjoyed this chapter, consider liking, commenting, or sharing with your friends. All these things help with the algorithms and help me to get more visibility on YouTube. They're free for you to do, and I appreciate them. Happy listening!